Welcome back to the Around the Block podcast from Coinbase. I'm Justin Mart. And I'm Catherine Wu. And what are we getting into this week? So from the top, I think this is going to be a two-part series because the topic we're talking about today are DAOs, which stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organizations. organizations. <laughs> <laughs> it's a mouthful. Um, so it's going to be a two-part series. Today is part one. Obviously, next week, we're going to follow up with part two. Yeah, there's a lot to get into, as you mentioned. So who do we have on today? Today, we're talking to Jesse Pollock. He is a longtime Coinbase employee, our director of engineering on a retail app. And I've known Jesse for a while. He's, I'm extremely excited to have him on because he's this rare combination of smart, articulate, passionate, and he's fallen down the Dow rabbit hole, knows a heck of a lot about it, and I'm super excited to talk about it with him. So let's dive on in. Amazing. Let's get it started. Obviously, this topic is, I think, near and dear to your heart and near and dear to a lot of people in crypto blowing up these days. Um, so I'd actually love to just start it off with the very simple but sneakily challenging question. What the heck is a DAO? How do you explain it? The one sentence answer is it's a software enabled organization. And, and the analogy that I like to use with folks is if you look at what's happened over the last 30 years with communications and software, i.e. we've gone from sending letters that were expensive and slow to having software totally change the way we communicate. Now all of us send millions of messages, probably a year, you know, hundreds of messages a day. I think we're at the beginning of seeing that same transformation happen with organizations and particularly like how humans come together to make decisions in groups. And we're gonna see the same sort of creative explosion over the next 10 years with how we organize ourselves that we've seen with communication over the last you know, 20, 30 years. So what exactly does it mean to be a software enabled corporation? Like what, what, what are the nuts and bolts there? Like what, what exactly is happening? So I think one thing that we're seeing emerge, you know, is basically uh, that when you have a software enabled organization, one of the utilities that comes with that is you have kind of like a shared bank account that people can manage as a group and they can be spread all over the world. They can come together to have the shared bank account and they can decide what to do with it. But whereas, you know, if you want to manage a shared bank account right now in a traditional organization, you'd need to have a really complex operating agreement and you need to have lawyers review that and you need to have all these terms written in complex legalese that you probably don't understand and you definitely have to pay someone hundreds or thousands of dollars to set up for you. Now, you can use software to make all of that basically instant to create and you can define the rules in, you know, using simple building blocks that make it so you don't have to have the complex legalese. And so you can say, hey, there's the three of us in this room. We have this pool of money. We want to vote. And so you need two of three votes in order to decide what to do with the money. You know, that would be the simplest thing. But the cool thing about software is that it's a platform. And what that means is you can build arbitrarily complex ways of making decisions on top of it. So maybe we start with, we need two of three votes in order to decide what to do with the money in our shared bank account. But then let's say we add another thousand people to our little community. And now we have a thousand and three people. Mm. We probably don't want, you know, just requiring two votes at that point. We definitely don't want it. We probably don't even want just requiring a majority of votes at that point, because maybe then we fall into, you know, tra classic tragedy of the commons trap or, you know, representative democracies where we've seen that fail with, for instance, like props. Um, and so maybe we experiment with a liquid democracy where rather than saying, hey, everyone has to vote, you can say, hey, here are a few people that we trust and you can delegate your vote to them and then they can make decisions for us. And that's a way of making so that you have experts who are closer to that decision-making process. So that's not to say that those are the only two options. That is to say that the cool thing about software is it allows you to build arbitrarily complex systems uh, in incremental ways to make you know decisions. Is it mostly about managing capital? That's sort of the, the innovation where software helps us is figuring out how to manage that capital, how to deploy it. Or is the software element also in other aspects of this you know, organize, organization of people? I'd say it's definitely not just capital. And I would say that capital is you know, the thing that makes the world go round, right? Like the, the, my way of thinking about capital is that's kind of like a battery, right? And if you have the battery of capital, you can plug it into a system, whether that system is a nonprofit or a for-profit or a you know PTA that you have at your local school. And the more of that battery you have, probably the more things that you can do. And right now in our society, we have you know a few of those systems that we can use. And I think the thing that we're seeing with 
crypto and with DAOs is we're basically having a really extensible way of building those systems that will make it from us, take us from having a few to having an incredible number of them that will be all over the spectrum from nonprofit to for-profit, from centralized to decentralized, and will really allow us to experiment with how we organize around capital. There's a couple of whys I want to talk about, right? Which is A, why now, right? B, why the need for a decentralized autonomous organization, whatever that means? And and C, um, what lessons can we borrow, I guess, from existing ways that humans have organized? Because what you're saying around decision making, whatever software enables is not necessarily new. It's not necessarily like revolutionary. So I just want to, I think, historically Mm kind of lend some more perspective Mm -hmm. actually into like this new wave of organizing. So the first thing in terms of why now, I think a lot of that relates to kind of where we are in our trajectory with crypto. And I think the, the key thing that we've seen over the last 10 years is that we have built crypto systems like Bitcoin and Ethereum, which have allowed communities to create money for themselves. And that's a pretty powerful thing, right? Like historically, when you thought about who could create money, you couldn't have people all over the world say, hey, let's publish the Bitcoin white paper on the thing and say that that's money, right? It just Mm -hmm. wasn't possible. And instead you had to have trusted institutions like the US government or the Eurozone or the Chinese government say, hey, this is money and you trust it because we're the centralized institution that says so. And over the last 10 years with Bitcoin and Ethereum, we've seen that now communities can come together and they can say, hey, because of decentralization, because of this technology innovation that is crypto, we can now for the first time create money for ourselves and say that it's valuable. And our collective belief in that value And our collective belief in the decentralized technology that enables that value is going to give us that magical power. And I think that was a critical foundation because until we had the ability for communities and and, and organizations to say, hey, let's create our own versions of capital, we couldn't have the, the platform really for people to then say, let's organize around those new forms of capital. And then more importantly, I'd say really in the last few years, we've started to see a really intense need for us to organize. And that's, you know, the classic thing that you see when you're thinking about building products. Like, what's the user need? And the user need that's emerged is we have these really, really critical protocols, things like Compound, where people are lending to each other, things like Uniswap, where people are exchanging assets, things like ENS or the Ethereum name service, where people are registering their identities. And these are critical pieces of infrastructure, but they're built on this new decentralized platform. And the need that emerged is someone needed to be making decisions about how those pieces of infrastructure changed, how they evolved, how they grew, what assets they supported, you know, what uh, decisions they wanted to make about their long-term roadmap. And I think it became apparent to the people who are building those protocols that if you just put that decision-making power in a centralized entity, we're replicating that what already exists. wasn't going to work. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You're replicating what's already existed. And so I think from these protocols and the utility that came with these protocols, we basically started to see a need, which was like, we need a way to make decentralized decisions about what happens to these protocols. And from that has sprung kind of this emergence of decentralized organizations that are doing that. So we're kind of reinventing the way that uh, applications and humanity can kind of form together and, and offer services and products to the world. But when they're decentralized by nature, you don't have a centralized entity in control of them. So the question is, how do they update over Mm -hmm. time? How do they change over time? And that's where we need to have some sort of structure, some sort of organization that governs and manages these new applications. And in comes a DAO. Yeah. Exactly that. Yeah. Yeah. Also, um, I think you, Jesse, you brought up a really good point, which is like, what is the user need? And like, tying in with the why now i think it's important to like really zoom out on a macro level and realize that like i think in popular whether it's popular culture or just like among i think our collective um (laughs) discussions um there's been more and more of a disillusionment with power and and money right like let's just say i think more and more so power Mm -hmm. and money are starting to see be seen as like almost like a evil thing mostly because we've seen it concentrated in the hands of like too few people like when you talk about Mm -hmm. um wealth inequality when you talk about issues in our society 
most of it boils down to the fact that money and power are concentrated in the hands of very, very few people, right? And I think that's what DAOs are kind of trying to achieve, which is putting more power and money into the hands of more people. More equitable, open financial system. Yep. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So as we think about DAOs, what are some of the types that you have seen emerge in just the past year or two? So a few different kinds that have emerged. And I'll start with the ones that we were just talking about. And these are what I consider a kind of protocol DAOs. And that's basically the decentralized organizations that are managing and governing critical protocols that are being built in the ecosystem. So things like Compound, Uniswap, Ethereum name system, um, basically anything that is a a part of Ethereum, we need a way to organize and and, and govern that. And we're seeing DAOs spin up to manage that. And so I'd call that kind of a protocol DAO. Another form of DAO that we've seen emerge is what I might call an investing DAO or a curating DAO. And these are things like Flamingo DAO or the Lao or Paperclip DAO or Pleaser DAO. And basically what they're doing is they're aggregating capital. Maybe they have a bunch of people contribute capital. Uh, and then they're using that capital to make investments. Uh, and this might look kind of something like a venture capital firm. So I'd say that's the, that's the second one. I'd say another one that's still really early but is starting to emerge is, is what I consider maybe like a community DAO or a social DAO. And these are really almost more general purpose communities that are realizing that they need tools and and systems to start to decide what to do in the community. And that's maybe something like FWB, Friends with Benefits. And they're saying, hey, we want to have this token so we can coordinate as a community around our vision for what the world should be and then make decisions about how we can further that vision. I think that that's one of the earlier DAOs that are starting to emerge, but also one of the things that I'm, I'm most excited about. I don't know if you zoom out 10, 20 years from now, we're going to look back in this podcast and go, man, we were talking about DAOs. Like these things are everywhere. Like we all know what they are because because they are so going to be so fundamental to our lives. Yeah. And I think that's exactly right. 10 years from now, we're not going to be talking about DAOs. We're just going to be talking about organizations. And our organizations will have been supercharged by software in the same way our communications have been supercharged by software. And there will be more decentralization because that's the core Hmm. part of what it is. But I think it's going to fade into the background. We're going to have you know, more decentralization of power and capital, which means a more level playing field. I also think we're going to just have more transparency and openness. And so we can actually build better verifiable systems to make sure that people are doing what they say they're doing. And then finally, I think we'll have a lot more efficiency. We'll actually be better at making decisions as collective bodies, which will make us be able to deliver cooler, better, bigger things. So I'm wondering here with DAOs, right? We're going to reinvent kind of the way humans, you know, you know, make decisions in a decentralized organization. We're going to start small and build. But if you look at the trajectory here, what are some pitfalls you think we might run up against? What are some challenges in building a system? Where might this process fail a little bit when we talk about decentralized ways of making decisions and running organizations? I'd say like the biggest risk is throwing the baby out with the bathwater, saying, hey, we have this new technology, therefore we can throw out everything we've learned Mm. about how to build organizations. I just don't think that's realistic. And I'm not sure exactly how much of it we're going to keep, but I think we're going to keep a lot of those learnings. DAOs are almost a little bit of a misnomer because it leads to a lot of wrong assumptions, right? Because I think one of the biggest pushbacks I get is, what do you mean it's a decentralized? That means nobody's making decisions and that means nobody can get anything done. So I think on that kind of uh, train of thought, uh, what are the bigger kind of mistaken assumptions people make when they first hear about decentralized autonomous organizations? Yeah, and I, I love that point. And I think it is totally a misnomer. And I think, you know, you're kind of getting at one of the ones that people uh, often jump to, which is like, hey, there are these new decentralized autonomous organizations. Doesn't that just mean like we're going to be paralyzed in our decision making because we're going to have to get everyone to agree? Yep. You know, like that sounds horrible, right? Right. Like, like it's hard enough to get 10 that... friends to agree to dinner at like one <laughs> night together. How are you supposed to make right, big exactly. decisions? Hard. I think that we probably will have some organizations that use the software that comes with DAOs, you know, governance software, and have really hierarchical centralized structures that look a lot like the corporations that we have today. Similarly, I think we'll have things on the other end of the spectrum where we'll have organizations that have no centralized structure. And it really is just like a milieu of people making decisions when they need to make decisions and building coordinating systems to do that. And I also think that that is a spectrum and we will have DAOs at every point along that spectrum. 
right? You'll have some with some centralization, but a lot of decentralization, some with a lot of centralization, some decentralization, but basically each organization and each collective body of humans will be able to almost self-determine like what are their needs, right? Like what would be the perfect organizational structure for them? And I think the the work of all of us, you know, who are interested in DAOs and excited about DAOs is how do we start making those building blocks really easy to use, really understandable, and then bringing them to communities who have problems and really who, who probably haven't fit into our existing systems today and start saying, hey, we have these new building blocks. Let us work with you to figure out what's right mm. for you. Obviously, there's no one size fits all because there's no one type of community, yeah, yeah, right? Like exactly. every community has different needs. They have different totally. reasons for organizing. So that's also a really good point is that like none of this is a fixed definition. <laughs> the whole point is that it can be flexible and exactly. suit your needs. I think this is one of the most powerful things that will happen in the next 10 years is there's all this value that we all know intuitively exists, right? Like think about your favorite community, whatever it is, right? Like maybe it's your sports team that you love, or maybe it's your uh, alumni network, or maybe it's your, you know, the fellowship that you're a part of that was just like integral to who you are and your experience. When you think about that community and you think about the network of people that are in it, I imagine that there's a lot of value there for you. You have your relationships, you know, maybe that when you publish something, they people like it and they appreciate it, they read it, you get distribution. Maybe they give you opportunities when you're looking for a new job. Maybe when you want to start something, they're the sounding board that helps you think through that through. There's all this value that currently in that community is implicit, right? No one's paying for that. No one's saying, hey, like you need to give me money in order to get my advice. They're giving it to you because that's what makes that community thrive that would make that's what makes it special and i think the thing that's going to happen with crypto which is powerful but also i think scary for folks and should be scary is that value that's currently implicit now has a technology that can be used to make it explicit and start to uh turn implicit value into explicit value by saying hey we're going to create a token and by participating in this networking community, you're going to earn some of these tokens. And by giving back, that's going to be rewarded. And then you're going to feel ownership over this community in some way. And you're going to have a voice there. Yeah. DAOs have been around for a few years, right? The first ever DAO, at least that I know of, is an investment DAO. Um, and then there were a couple more iterations on that. And that was always investment focused. And what I never really got about that was that it was still based on uh, how much money do you have to get involved, right? It was mm -hmm. still very much like barriered around, do you have the knowledge to understand crypto? Do you have then the money to buy Ethereum to then get into this club that actually mm -hmm. ends up being very exclusive? So personally for me, DAOs never clicked totally. until um, actually one of my close friends started working for a co-op. And then I started to rethink uh, DAOs as a new way of um, decision-making and stakeholders all having equal say and everyone pooling, uh, it could be capital, right? Because usually in a co-op business, um, it's a bunch of small businesses that get together and they all make decisions, but they also pool capital together. Mm -hmm. And that's the lens that I actually first understood DAOs as actually it's more around um, decision making and empowering uh, yeah. decision making on all levels instead of a uh, you can only come in if you can contribute X amount of Ethereum because that for me was never interesting. Yeah, I think that investment DAOs and ones where you need to contribute X or have Y amount of money are, from my perspective, the least interesting you know, component of DAOs because in many ways, they're similar to structures that we have today. They're going to be at a bigger scale. They're going to have more participants. But that reality of like you need something uh, monetary that a lot of people don't have in order to participate is just going to keep out so many people in the world from participating in them. And I think the, 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 the ones that are gonna be much more interesting are the ones where you don't need money to participate, yeah. where you can do things in the world and be a part of the DAO through doing those things in the world. And we're starting to see really emerge in crypto is the idea of retroactive public goods funding, which is basically the idea that all of us are constantly operating in these public goods spaces, whether that's your local community, where you might be picking up trash or helping your neighbor, or it's your company community where you're creating the knowledge that sits there, or your alumni community. We're all operating in these spaces 
that we share. And I think the biggest fear that people have is if we make those spaces economic, it will pervert our incentives for operating in them, right? Like why pick up trash if I now have a price mm -hmm. to picking up trash? Like that stinks. I just want to pick up trash because I love my community and because I want to invest in my community because this is my home. And I think the thing that we're going to see and we're going to see DAOs try and navigate is their power in having economic tools. And they want to use those economic tools because it will allow the communities to do more. And if they bring in the economic tools too directly, they will overly monetize the actions that people do. And I think what we will likely see emerge is people retroactively looking back and saying, hey, rather than us telling you, if you do this thing, you get money, we're going to say, you should be the best contributor to our community that you possibly can be. And you should do what is authentic to you that you think is gonna make our community thrive. And then a year from now, or two, year, two years from now, we're gonna look back and we're gonna say, what was the impact? Was it positive? Was it negative? And we'll reward you on that. And you can trust that. And now there's a whole bunch of infrastructure that needs to get built in order yeah. to make those ecosystems work. And then our economic systems will recognize and validate that retroactively ex post facto and make sure that they have the financial resources that the community has kind of bestowed on them. This is this is crazy because I think we thought we were talking about DAOs today, but we're really talking about how to re-engineer <laughs> incentives across all of humanity and potentially change the way we align ourselves and our communities and the public goods, all this. I mean, yeah, this is this is much more expansive than just a decentralized organization. So I think a more concrete way that I think about it is that um, it's allowing us for the first time to really examine the relationship between labor and money, between labor and power. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because I think yeah. one of the most 100%. harmful, like, most harmful effects of the hardworking myth is that if you work hard, you will have money and you will have power. But we all know that's not true. I think some of the hardest working totally. people in terms of hours, in terms of labor, um, there's not always a direct correlation there. It's because we all operate in these systems where all of the incentive structures and the dynamics are not clear to us. Yeah. They're not transparent. They're hidden. We are now at this point in human history where we have a new technology. And this new technology has been built to not just let us examine these systems and this relationship between labor and capital, but let us start to do something about it and start to do something about it at the scale and on the same playing field that centralized organizations have been playing on for the last 20, 30 years in technology. And I think my gut tells me that people are gonna put up their hands and they're gonna be like, hell yes. That is what I want because there are people right now who are hungry for that, who are doing that examination and they haven't had the technology. And now we're going to give them the technology and they're, you know, I think people are going to run towards it. So I'm excited about it. This is super inspiring, right? So I want to note one thing here and it's that, you know, the early days of the internet were kind of decentralized too. And then it was co-opted by centralized forces. Mm -hmm. And we actually see this a lot in technologies. New technologies that come out end up, they probably start relatively decentralized. It's a core group of small, passionate people that kind of share the passion, right? Totally. And then it ends up being co-opted by centralized forces and turns into something different. I'm wondering if we're, if, totally. is this the panacea? Is our DAOs going to be the thing that really solves it once and for all? Or is it going to end up being co-opted again by centralized forces? Like, it's a big meta philosophical question, but, you know, I wonder about that. Okay, I actually have a thought about this. For the first time, you know, and, and we both sit on the Coinbase Ventures team, right? And I was yep. working in venture capital before. Um, I have never seen such a big flock of new entrepreneurs and builders who come to me with a roadmap on actually how to take power out of their hands in the long run. So the assumption mm -hmm. is actually no yeah. longer, especially in our industry, I think with people who uh, understand where the world is moving, the assumption is no longer just because you're the founder that you will always have the most power in this company by way of mm -hmm. equity, by way of ownership. For the first time, I'm actually seeing in the majority of the pitches I get of private companies where founders come in with a plan, with a mission that ultimately the company, I don't want it to be in just my hands. And I want it to be decentralized in a way that gives totally. more power and voice to the people. So just to actually uncharacteristically yeah, play, I think be more optimistic yeah. here. I'm seeing a real shift. Yeah. And I don't think it's, I, I think, and going back to your question, Justin, of like, what's going to make this different? Right. And, you know, I, I'm not a hundred percent certain, right. You know, maybe I'll, we'll be looking back on this in 10 years and be like, wow, they were really overly optimistic. <laughs> but I think the thing that is meaningfully different right now is for the first time at the lowest level of the new systems that are being built, 
i.e. the like bottom of the abstraction stack, um, we have decentralization. And that is decentralization of capital, i.e. the capital networks of Ethereum and Bitcoin are not centrally controlled. And I think what people have seen is those capital networks that are not centrally controlled are actually way more powerful because they're decentralized. And because they're decentralized, that they actually inject a force of decentralization into everything that is built on top of them. And I think as we enter the 21st century and as we are embracing this new technology, what we're seeing for the first time is that we can create decentralized capital systems with technology and that those capital systems can actually permeate the value of decentralization up from the capital system into the organizational system, yeah. from the organizational system into the product system, from the product system into the user experience. And I think that foundational innovation of we can now have decentralized capital is going to mean now we can have decentralized everything because capital is the battery that powers everything. And when you have decentralized capital, it's going to force most things to be decentralized. Now, yeah. I could be wrong, but you know, like Catherine says, you guys are sitting at the biggest centralized company or the, one of the biggest centralized companies in crypto doing venture investments. And the majority of investments are coming to you and saying, here is our roadmap for giving up power to the decentralized system. Yeah. When I think have we ever seen that before? We, we yeah. haven't. We just haven't. Yeah. yeah. Never. You're, yeah. you're right that this it, is a very it, critical it, it, new it, it, thing. Yeah. First off, yeah. I'm like super inspired. Uh, it's kind of rare, actually, to have conversations like this that remind you again of, oh, my gosh, the passion and excitement that crypto really can innovate on social structures, on the things that really matter, right? We're all so much these days about finance and making money, all this stuff that's honestly kind of like bro and ugh, I don't like it, right? This is exciting. The question I have, though, is um, I'll just pose it simply. Are we going to see evil Dow? Yes, there will be, right? Like, and I think this is the the thing that we often see with crypto and kind of the you know, some of the negativity around crypto is people are like, oh, you have these new centralized, I mean, these decentralized systems and like money laundering is happening on them. It's like, yeah, money laundering is happening on them. Money laundering is also happening in all of our centralized systems. The amount of money laundering that yeah. happens through cash and dollars is like many orders of magnitude, or at least one order of magnitude, probably multiple orders of magnitude greater than happens on crypto, but it's still there, right? And we will see negative things happen by people organizing negatively in things like evil DAOs as a result of this technology chain. Absolutely. I think for me, this question is almost like a little bit of a Rorschach test. It's like, do you believe that humans are ultimately good or bad on the collective scale? And I'm, I'm the ultimate optimist, right? Like you probably could tell I that love it. This whole conversation, <laughs> but I believe humans are good. Right. And I think that we're going to see bad things and it, you know, it might be a bumpy road and people will try and organize in negative ways. But at the end of the day, our collective spirit will bend towards justice and collective well-being and positivity. And that that <laughs> is going to be amplified at such a larger scale than the negative stuff that, you know, we might see it, but it's not going to be as, as impactful. That's so, a very American take, my... <laughs> Jesse. That's a very American take. <laughs> I'm here for it, though. I don't know. Call me American, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and and, and, and I'll, I'll, call, I'll call that, you know, I'll, just to like check my privilege, which I will do. Like, you know, I, I come from an upper middle class background. I'm like a white guy uh, living in the Bay Area. So I, I will say that I think that that comes from that bias. Right. And I think if we give our world better tools for organizing around capital in a collectively governed way, what we're going to see is we're going to see the best of people come out and we're going to see new systems that make our world a better, a better place. So, uh, I got goosebumps, man. About it. Uh, seriously. Like, <laughs> I, I mean, call, call <laughs> me American too, but like, I, I actually like, like it. Yeah. yeah I mean, look, like sometimes, sometimes, and I fully hear myself when I have conversations with people who are so pumped and like we all believe in the same future sometimes i have this like weird outer body moment where i'm like do i sound like a crazy religious mm. fanatic right now <laughs> and and i want to say like i think so a little bit yeah um and i also yeah. think it's important to point out that like this is the grand vision of what we want to do right and like do i think yeah. software is going to eliminate human evil no of course not but no. but Definitely. i think again for the first time not only are we examining but we actually have tools to enable again and this is what i said from the beginning um putting more decision making and power into the hands of more people yeah i totally agree and i think i think also we need to go learn from the people who are doing this work you know even yeah. pre-crypto 
yeah. this is one of the things that I, I'm really trying to do in my work is like, I can think that crypto is this crazy, powerful technology that's going to bring about a lot of good. And I want to really understand the work that people are doing right now without the technology to explore cooperative governance and see how that can change the systems that they're a part of. Yeah. And, and Justin and I sit here, you know, like uh, on top of our full time jobs, because educating people is also a huge part to it. It's one of the more rewarding parts, frankly. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. how are you going to use the tools yeah. uh, that give you power if you can't use it? Like, yeah. it comes from education. And like, that's one of my totally. big personal motivations, right, is to like translate crypto which is scary and and maybe like hard to understand into terms that's like actually like i just i think it should be more inclusive yeah. on that note jesse yeah. if people want to get involved in DAOs, if they want to jump into this world contribute towards it where sh where can they go how can they get started well i hope coinbase is going to start putting out more resources to help people with this journey so that's the first that's the first thing hopefully stay tuned um <laughs> you know we're working on it that's one i think this podcast is a great first start um, in terms of other other places to start, I think first starting by just making sure you have a like basic understanding of crypto is probably the best thing. Like buy some Ethereum, right? Like go interact with some of the DAOs that exist in the world. I think like really using this technology is probably the the, the first best step. After that, what what I like to tell people, and this is a little bit of a hard a hard matching problem, but right now someone is creating a DAO that is oriented towards your favorite thing. I don't know what your favorite thing is. Maybe it's your sports team. Maybe it's your cause that you really care about climate change or you know, housing or street safety. But someone somewhere is creating a DAO that is focused on that. They don't know exactly what it's going to be. They don't know exactly what it looks like, but they're experimenting with a new organizational structure and these new powerful tools to see what would it look like if we tried to solve this problem or engage with this community using these new technologies. And... What I tell people is go find those people, go find that space because you're you're going to have way less interest and excitement if you're just trying to learn about DAOs theoretically, and you're going to be way more engaged and it's going to become a way bigger part of your life. If you go find the thing that you already love, that you already care about, and you say, how does the technology apply to this context? So that'd be my recommendation. And if you're looking for a, a little help with matching, uh, i.e. you're like, I love this. Where can I find the DAO working on? Tweet at me. I'm Jesse Pollock on Twitter. I'll try my best to help you. I really want someone to build the website where it's like you can put in any 501c3 and you'll get spit out the DAO that's trying to say, solve the same problem. Um, haven't built that yet. If someone wants to build that, also, you can hit me up and we'll build it. <laughs> awesome. Well, I think that's a really great ending point. Yeah, it is, for sure. Um, thank you so much, Jesse, for taking the time great to, to have talk you. to us. Yeah. yeah, what a wholesome conversation. <laughs> Well, that was an amazing conversation. We thought we were going to talk about just decentralized organizations. And then it turns out we're talking about how we view humanity and how we're going to solve, like, or try to solve all of these problems in the world and reorganize, you know, our collective action. It's it's a much bigger topic than just decentralized organizations. Yeah. I mean, well, what are organizations if not made of humans who contribute labor and time? Yeah. You know, so when you want to talk about disrupting it, you're going to talk about disrupting larger things. You're going to touch on issues that are uncomfortable. I think we were correct. It definitely has to be a two-part conversation. We can't get into all the DAO things today. So tune in next week when we talk to Kinjal Shah about some of the nitty-gritty pieces of how DAOs operate today. Thanks for tuning in. As always, leave us a comment, tweet at us if you have any thoughts or suggestions, and make sure to follow us wherever you're getting this podcast, um, including YouTube. And we also have a landing page, coinbase.com slash around the block. And stay tuned for next week's edition. Talk to you then. See you guys then. Today's conversation is for informational purposes only and does not constitute legal or investment advice. Actual results may vary materially from any forward-looking statements made and are subject to risks and uncertainties. 